um, well, today is, in a sense, the third event in a row uh, in our kind of Okinawa-related series. But you may wonder, um, Linda obviously isn't Okinawa. Um, so uh, I'll speak of the Linda Hartenstein, who is um, an artist, an interdisciplinary artist. Um, but she does have links with Okinawa and has made some of her work uh, in Okinawa and also has made some of her work in collaboration uh, with Yugen, uh, who is an Okinawan artist, so I mean, I'll leave it to her to tell you all about that. Um, but um, she operates very much on an international scale. Um, she has exhibited uh, not only in uh, Japan, but also in China, and done a lot of work in Korea. Um, she's based in, in Berlin uh, and has obviously shown there as well. Um, and uh, well, that's probably all I need to say, and I'll leave the rest of it to Linda. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, Jason, for the introduction. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and thank you very much for the Taiwan Foundation and the entire to giving me the opportunity to introduce my works here um, within the framework of Yukon Terrier's solo show and the Okinawa Week. Um, that being said, I will pretty much focus on um, the work I've done in collaboration with you, Canteria, works that I've done within the greater Asian area, um, in Korea and Okinawa and Japan, and just a very brief outlook uh, to my recent projects uh, that are a little bit different than the works that I will introduce before. Um, that's just what I said, basically, the outline of the, of the talk. Um, and I started with the works in collaboration with you, Canteria, the First one, some of you might have seen already downstairs, it's on display. Um, it's called The Apology. It's a work that was born out of conversation with Yukon uh, when we were discussing pretty much the, the relationship of individuals and of, uh, with collectives, largely <coughs> with, with governments and whatsoever, and he voiced his frustration um, about the, the Japanese government, because he, he has a Japanese passport, to um, issue an apology to a group, a certain group, that was um, that was victim to war atrocities. And we were discussing why the government can be so much a representative and a representation for the people, why it wouldn't work vice versa. So as a Japanese passport holder, doesn't he have the power to say something on behalf of his passport? So um, we were pounding this kind of like idea back and forth and we we're thinking to just enlarge on it and to think more broadly about like what is the individual, what is the collective, what kind of like responsibility do you have with the position that you are born into, with the structures that you are gone through, the education do you receive, and all of the privileges of course. Um, that's a discussion I think that is also very much uh, being focused on in the terms of uh, post-colonialism. And uh, we started to work on this project, and I'll just show you very briefly um, an excerpt from it. I'm sorry. So as you uh, witness, this is an, an open apology. It's not said what this person feels sorry for. Um, it tries to avoid the exclusion that comes with definition. Um, every person who was, this, this is a series of videos, so there's like 
At the moment there's, uh, I think, seven of them. This is an ongoing project. And we participants in that series is encouraged to think about their own positioning within a wider social context. And if they have received privileges, what kind of like positioning they have over others. And to formulate an apology or maybe just a, a reasoning on it within themselves and just say out loud the word, I'm sorry. So this is also about the process of like really trying to focus yourself within your positioning. Um, and then, of course, there's like the, the idea of intersectionality and there the person that we just saw came to Germany originally as a refugee and um, was able to retrieve like the German uh, citizenship is now doing a life, has now a life that is, um, he says it's very good. He's told me that he's also reflecting on this in his apology, but he's also reflecting on uh, the very hard times that he had when he was in an East German um, refugee camp. So, I mean, refugee camp is the one word, but like in, in this kind of place where you have to stay due to German laws in a very confined area. So um, this is also about making the viewer wonder what could this pure person be apologizing for. We have people in there that usually are not considered to be in a position to having to apologize. We have trans people in there again. We have people who have like a history of uh, refuge. We have of course like um, I'm also in the video. I reflect on my appearance and all of like the progress coming to me within uh, my the place where I was born with the passport that I hold and also with the kind of like structural privileges that I've received. Um, but every single person in there decides for themselves how they position themselves. And it's, uh, it's very much about the things that are appearing on their face when they try to formulate and actually position themselves within a wider societal context and cultural context and within history, of course. Um, another work we've been doing together is, uh, is this one. It's called This One Is On Us. It was made for the Bangkok Biennial. Um, looks very different than the video piece, obviously. Um, and it is a bar. Um, it is a bar that was actually operating, was operating during the biennial. Um, so we were thinking, and this is also coming out of a discussion with you again, we had for a longer time, that we um, always wanted to make a, a parliament bar in the same way as there is sports bars. Because we always liked how people are actually so engaged and just like sitting around chatting very casually about sports and we wanted to have people the same way of engagement with politics. So we were like dreaming about making that, couldn't of course like just make up this pub, so we decided to make it as an installation uh, at the Bangkok Biennial. And um, due to circumstances we had a lot of supply of Abamori, which is a, a traditional Okinawan liquor. Um, so we, um, yeah, this is a photo when the bar was actually operating. This is some of, there was, it's a mixture of Thai white spirits and, and Avamori, which is uh, also white spirits within the, um, within the terms of that, that maker. And uh, what we did is we, we had the video screen, roughly like you had it in, in sports class, but it had to fit within a certain space. And um, we, got a lot of footages from parliamentary sessions all over the greater Pacific space, including the uh, US elections that were just going on and every that was the time where there was like the debates going on. So every time there was a debate, we had like live streaming, people could come, watch it together. Um, on the bar counter itself were photos from grassroots movement that we collect, like stickers from grassroots movements that we collected all over Berlin to get this connection of like how actually in punk bars whatsoever, you actually have a lot of like political movements that we wanted to bring into the sports bar kind of like connected somehow. And as you can see on the on the left side, this is uh, this is parliamentary sessions. It's from Thailand, it's from uh, Indonesia. We have Burmese, um, Chinese, I mean, like really also covering the kind of like parliamentary sessions that would never come into any kind of like discussion with each other. So it was very important for us to somehow bring a situation where there would be like the, the People's Congress of China in the same situation with like the Taiwanese government and uh, like discussions that would be very much focusing on 
elections or whatsoever, but also very much domestic situations that seem to be somehow covering the entire space. We wanted to overcome this idea of domestic problems because, of course, every country influences each other very greatly. Um, so this is just also an excerpt from, from that, just right at the top, that's uh, the Thai parliament. Then this is on the left side, I think this is Taiwan. Of course, this is Xi Jinping. This is uh, the late um, Home Prime Minister Abe, uh, Moon from Korea, and uh, this is a secretary from from the U.S. Department, and we assembled them in a way. You always hear one person talk mainly, but they seem to somehow somehow be in the same situation. And we ordered them also in a way that, for example, on the very left side, this is. Uh, <coughs> This is a person from the from the Japanese Defense Ministry making a statement on the situation in Okinawa. But then, of course, like we have like uh, on the left side the Hong Kong elections. So it's it's mixing all the issues together because they all have to do with each other actually, and they're not purely domestic problems. And this is also like in Indonesia, it's, uh, it's elections. This is Malaysia. Um, just let it run for a little bit. It was a video installation, you could just watch it, but then also you can get to the part. So, like, uh, here we have, like, a Japanese opposition party talking about corruption. Um, she's talking about environmental issues. And then, sorry, um, and then that will all come into connection with each other, as if this was actually one greater global discussion there is. Um, um, so now I come to works that I created in Okinawa, Japan, and Korea. Um, the first one, because it's Okinawa week, it's, uh, it's, it has actually an Okinawan language title that I'm very barely able to pronounce properly. Um, it's Chilachoropi, I think, I don't know. But um, it meets roughly the day of departure. We had to ask a linguist and he would, I avoided transliterating into Japanese because Japanese um, hiragana is not able to really properly um, represent the, the phonemes that are used in Okinawan. And um, this is a, a work that was done after I stayed for a very long time in Japan and Okinawa and have um, basically researched also among the, the activists, the, the environmental activists, the anti-base activists there. And it's a kind of like wrap up for me to also digest all of the emotions that you had and also kind of like put into a symbolic manner what I saw there. And um, it's, it's like half performance, half film. I ask people who live in Okinawa, who are engaged with the process, but also just normal like inhabitants um, to walk into the sea like on the left, they're holding like traditional um, dragon boat race oars, so like cultural items. <coughs> and to imagine that their feet connect tightly with the, with the island and that they try to move the island like a ship and to move it away from its geographical, geological, geopolitical determination that is like deeply like with the, the bases be there because right in front of China, um, because it's in, in the proximity to Japan. 
So to basically, and this was also an image for me, how these people were trying to win this fight that is absolutely impossible, trying to uh, basically go over the will of the US, global US security structures that are hardly able to overcome. But they've been doing it basically since 50 years. So for me, that was like the best image to show like what kind of strengths and what kind of like Japanese would say kiyoi they put in it. And it's a two-channel installation, and it kind of like tries to um, also depict nature as a kind of agent in the situation, as if the island itself was alive and part of the endeavor to to move the island. To, to avoid the language of the normal language of protest and the, 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 the language of politics that is in there, but just really show how they use their bodies and everything that comes with it. All of the risk that also comes with using your body in, in a political endeavor. At the end, it comes together in a way that it seems like the island is really a little bit moving, but... <laughs> um, and I just go on because we have like some time constraints. This is a work that I did when I was in Korea. I was in 2015 in Korea uh, with the National Museum there for modern contemporary art. And I did... Uh, I wanted to make like... I was focusing on another work and this just happened on the side. Um, this is a work that has a very simple gesture at its core which um, turns out very different. This is facial cream that I just apply to my face more and more and more. Um, the goal of the performance is to completely level out any features in my face and make it a level thing that connects to the background. And at the end of the performance, like also all vital functions are completely covered up and I cannot breathe anymore. So it's mm -hmm. also like a, a durational work. And I uh, came up with this idea when I went to the part south of the river, Kangnam, which was largely um, developed in the 80s, beginning of the 80s. And um, it was completely bulldozed once, and then they built city structures that looked like the same as anywhere else in modern cities. Like if you, I mean, a lot of you have probably been to global, um, to global metropolitan areas. They somehow have something in common. They conform to certain needs and to certain imaginations of being in an urban space. Um, that is very limited. I feel. And at the same time, around Kangnam, there was this advertisement for um, for facial surgery with before and after images, and the after image was always the same. So this kind of like this leveling out, this making everything to zero in the life, how people organize in the cities and then also in their bodies, kind of like seemed the same to me. So I decided to just make this work that completely levels out everything. <clears throat> this is more about the imagination of what, what human life is like and how it's organized and how it's structured and what is good and whatsoever than a comment on I don't want to make any comment on, on beauty surgery everyone is absolutely free to do with their body what they want um, but it's more about this kind of like what ideas are behind this right? like what kind of like um, At some point, it's halfway. Um, 
for that. This was the work that I was actually working on. It's called Kuyong Walks. Um, it's also about Gangnam. At the very, when I was there, um, the very southern edge of Seoul um, was about to be developed, but there was like an illegal settlement that's been there since before the 80s. So people have been living there for more than one generation. Um, they were about to get evicted from this area that kept them all together. So the, this area had, um, this is the area on the map, um, had like also a recycling store. So a lot of people lived from like bringing all of the trash from the city, recycling in it there and then eating there. And then also for all of the like organizations that care for them, some Buddhist organizations, they would go there directly to deliver help and charity and care for these mostly elderly at that point residents. And um, I was just researching about that. And there was also talks about compensation, but it was more like on, on which political level that would happen. But what I was really um, intrigued by is that I couldn't find it. This is the, I looked on every digital <coughs> map that I could find, including like this Korean thing that is called neighbor maps. This is much, working much better than uh, Google Maps there. And you can see this is the area. If you make uh, on satellite, this is how it actually looks like. And um, you can see here, every single house is numbered. And these houses are much, much younger than these houses. Like this has been developed much, much later, but this is not existing on the maps. So it's not existing in city planning. It's not existing in all of the representations of what the city is, where the people live, what kind of life there is. Um, so I was like intrigued by this invisibility and by this non-representation that was happening there. Um, so what I did is I made a walk there and tracked myself. Like I, I walked the area. This is like a little bit off because part of the area was actually uh, shortly before burning down. Um, I walked an area where a lot of people lived, tracked myself, and basically left the GPS notes on Google, saying there's something, here's something. And then I recreated the same form, the same structure in all kinds of like iconic places in Seoul. So um, here is where it actually is. And then you see all of these little shapes, like these bird shapes. I should be able to do this with this thing here, let's see. Can I? No, I can't. But anyway, um, I'll just show it like, here's one, uh, here's one, up there is one, there's one. It was over, it was like seven places where I just, I tried to find streets whatsoever that would enable me to walk the same structure again to leave this structure on the servers on all of these maps to show that the same kind of like settlement and the same history because the people who lived there in Kuryong Mall were the ones who were actually building um, Seoul in the 80s. That this is everywhere in all of the newly iconic places. So I chose places like the, the newly rebuilt uh, palace, like um, business districts, there were a lot of places that were yet to be built but they were already on the maps because they were planned out completely digitally but if you go there it was still actually uh, shore like I had to walk in, in swamps whatsoever to, to walk the land or the building that was originally there so this is a lot about representation what we decide to um, keep in our digital and so forth um, memory and then what we do with the decisions that are made based on this information. So digital representation in the furthest sense. Um, does it work anymore? No, it doesn't work anymore. Okay. Um, I assembled these walks, it was video walks, and made this kind of tableau, where it just um, there show that there's basically no nothing, streets. or there is something, no but there's <coughs> definitely not this kind of like Land. structure that was originally in the middle. This is Kuyong Mall, this is the this settlement. It's not place. And it's like a video tableau that has the video walks together. Like a monitor, like a surveillance mm -hmm. room. Where we try to survey our entire you living. Know that the satellites nowhere. They tell me that they know. 
You are here, here within these five square meters, heading south. Keep going straight. They have a watching sign. And I put on top like an, an essay about like the 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 digital eye of humanity, the satellites, and, and the kind of how we organize the data that is coming down from them. And then I made like a series of drawings where I basically positioned the settlement within the area which I walked. So you'd have like a, a high rise kind of like a very very uh, expensive living area in the middle. You'd have suddenly the settlement. So creating own maps, basically. Um, this is a work, and this is, I think, the last one within uh, that one, uh, that I made in Japan earlier, like two years earlier, and this is also <coughs> about representation and about data and how that informs the space that we, that we uh, live in. And uh, it was while I was at the, at the Aomori Contemporary Art Center, which is a building that was designed by Tadao Ando, um, a very famous and very um, yeah, a very famous architect who's known for his really, um, how can I say that, impressive structures. And uh, his, so this is, as you can see, um, this is video sculptures. So these projections are three level videos. I'll just shortly show it. So there's like, the first projection goes onto the mirror that is up there. Then here's a screen, and then it goes down here as well. So you could walk into it. Three levels um, and three projections. And this is based on a calculation um, of the main building that is there. The lowermost down there is the structure of the building that this was shown at. Um, basically, the, the rendering of Tadao Ando, who was. Um, I mean, I had to live, or I was living, I had the honor to live into, in that structure for three months, and it's, um, it's quite an experience, I have to say. So I took this kind of like concentric structure to appropriate the architecture into a video walk. And um, I thought to myself, okay, this resembles pretty much the solar system in its concentric circles. Um, what if this was really the sun? and the center of a larger universe. I mean, you may hear out of myself that I'm making a little bit fun of him and uh, his grand ideas. Um, and then I calculated where all of the other planets would be here in concentric circles. And I conducted video walks along these orbits of the planet. And then uh, you, I made three projections with it. So this is the center of this universe, like filmed straight up from the from the um, art center, then there would be Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and um, that would be the projections. It's very conceptual, but that is also upon upon the conceptualness of the architecture. And this was for me that was the only way of really exhibiting there because the building is so grand and has so much presence that I only could respond to the building and could not just put something inside that is not in relation to the building. And um, this was also kind of like the beginning for me to work with data, work with the interaction of digital and, and um, analog realities. Because uh, this was in 2013, it's almost, yeah, it's nine years ago now. And, uh, oh, sorry. So yeah, it's like this is when it's dark, and it was exhibited on on several occasions. And um, just a short look into my recent projects that are again about the the dichotomy between um, yeah ideas of digitality and digital life and the, the the vision that we imagine in there, even though our lives are utterly post-digital, like digital structures run through the entirety of our lives, that so we have complete digital selves. And this is uh, this is oil painting. You can actually give me my phone. This is uh, an oil painting, and this is binary code. Um, so I rendered something very, very digital, very, very analogly. Um, 
And binary code is this zero one thing that is like the very basic language of data and computers. Um, so everywhere where there is like nothing that's a zero and when there's a dot that's a one. So there's actual text there. So this is just, the, the dots are always like very like defined kind of like little paintings in themselves but they become uh, larger panels like this. And um, so because this is, this is English text, it says something but as we are all not computers we cannot read it. Well, at least I think the majority of us are not computers. Um, and then, at some point, because I like to always think concepts further, 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 I decided to um, make an app that would be able to read it. Um, so I made. I don't know if you can see it. You, can you actually do that? Can you? Let me just show it. Do you have it? So it's up with this binary code and translate into mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can see it. So this is like, what is this? It's a digital sculpture that has the, the translation of it on it. I can just give it into okay. everyone. <laughs> so this is basically. It is basically. It's an entire, it's a, it's a two panel work. So this is like a part of a sentence. Right. There's also written something in the model. <coughs> So this is like a work that is that renders digital content very analogly, but it then again makes it very, very digital because there's like a digital sculpture associated. And this work is like two meters to one point fifty, so it becomes very big together with the digital structure that is then in there. I can make another work that is maybe a little bit easier to read. Wait, this one might be easier. Do you get it? I, had, I wanted to overcome this division of digitality and analogness, so I made, a, I made an exhibition where the same works are at the same time digital, but also very analog, but then again digital, and then this goes for on forever and ever, and it goes within a circular kind of mode. And the sentences that always refer to these little frictions between our digital and, and analog self, so there's a lot about, like, there's, for example, a work that says, the algorithm knew I was gay before I did. Because if you search certain things, look at things very long that the algorithm understands, you're gay, but you maybe haven't realized it yourself yet, and things like that. I mean, here it's written, I'm looking for hope in my mailbox, which um, just shows this, this very emotional attachment that we have to digital things, basically. So it's always about this function that is there. Um, and I've been working with code before as well. I use a lot of binary, I also use Morse code. And I like to invent just new structures of meaning, or to just distort, distort them a little bit. And at the moment, I'm working on, um, on a queer code that is not binary, to overcome the binariness of binary, but like a code that can have um, very, like, that can have multiple. Um, decipherations, because I think that reality is actually very ambiguous and very ambivalent, and the way that technology works, because it's based on this like very binary ideas, does not represent the reality and the multiple, I, like the multitude of possibilities that are within a certain situation very well. So I want to kind of like it's a very cultural, theoretical kind of like project, but I want to implement a kind of artistic code that has. That just means a lot of things at the same time, and also can like run programs that have multiple outcomes at the same time. And this is my current project. <laughs> so <I'm just> <laughs> yeah, and it's like there's uh, a lot of like little um, virtual like little sculptures will ever come together. This is another work. This is so this is an actual sculpture that can also be rendered. That also has a a digital appearance. This is about my background in, um, I was born in GDR and my family history is very much like has to do with disruptions that were along the, the, the solving of the GDR. And this is, uh, I mean, you all know this bottle, probably, I suppose you know. This is, uh, this is the only Coke that had survived um, the transformation. 
and um, in this region where I come from, this is actually sold better than Coca-Cola, and this is like the only place in Germany where it's sold better than Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. And um, so I made, I assembled them to one product, so into one of the shrinking films, um, whereas the Coca-Cola is zero and Beta Cola is one, and um, it's like one product. It's like how I am, <laughs> like all of these things coming together. And then um, when deciphered, it says, history is the story that is told. And all of the stories that are not told, they don't become history. So, that, I mean, it's not so long, it's just that history is the story that is told, and it's like this kind of box with a, with, there seems to be a plant inside that is living, but um, that, it, that is that. It's just like how this exhibition looked like it was uh, the beginning of this year, and um, we're still just mm. we're still have time. Wow, <laughs> very shortly. This is just a small video that introduced how, how you could walk along. So there's also um, this lamp emits Morse code. It's singing a song about forgetting. It was uh, the the office lamp of the Minister of Economics of GDR from. 76 until the GDR dissolved, and um, the lamp is totally functioning fine. Everyone's already dead, but all of the all of the structures they created, they are still there. So this lamp emits Morse code, where it's singing a GDR time song, actually about the desire to forget, because the, all the structures that they created, the infrastructure, the education, the history that my family has, all of that is still there and will continue living on, even though these people who have created it. This is the one that you saw. This one says, I'm not a robot, mm -hmm. or at least I hope I am not. And you could wander around and just explore this digital space that is there in this gallery as well. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>